Pearson Ravitt's story begins with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, a passionate OBGYN at the height of her career. But when a shoulder injury struck during a precipitous delivery, her dreams were shattered, leaving her unable to practice medicine. Determined to make a difference, Dr. Pearson became an advocate for her peers, guiding them through the complex disability process. Alongside insurance expert Scott Ravitz, Dr. Pearson founded Pearson Ravitz, a company determined to approach insurance differently. Together, they set their mission to educate and empower physicians to protect their most valuable asset, their income, and the most important people in their life, their family. Today, Pearson Ravitz serves the medical community in all 50 states. At Pearson Ravitz, they understand the unique concerns of physicians. Physician founded and physician focused, Pearson Ravitz builds human connections before they create quotes. Life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness or injury could leave you and your family in a devastating financial situation. But with a little planning and guidance, you can prepare for every possibility. Visit PearsonRavitz.com to schedule your consultation with a Pearson Ravitz advisor. This is a Physician's Guide to Divorce. Another two-parter. Here's part one. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Welcome back to the podcast. On today's show, we have something a little bit different. And just as a disclaimer, my wife and I are happily married. This is not a show. Most of the time, I have people on the show that are answering questions that I have. This is not specific to me, although... I am sure there are some audience members somewhere that are currently either getting divorced or that possibility might be in the future. So today's episode is going to be the physician's guide to divorce. We have on the show today, Morgan Stogsdale, who is a managing director at Beerman LLP and the host of How to Not Suck at Divorce podcast. Uh, She was named 40 under 40 attorneys to watch in Illinois by the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin one of the most influential women lawyers in Chicago by Crane's Chicago Business, and one of the top 10 women attorneys in Illinois by Emerging Lawyers. Morgan Stogsdale, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to meet you as well. So let's just take a first step here, right, for the unindoctrinated. Can you just walk the audience through the process of getting divorced? You know, I kind of break it up into a bunch of processes. So the first thing would be determining whether it's ripe for a divorce, whether you really are, you know, going that next step, which is engaging in a divorce. So that's number one. Once you figure out, yep, that's the right move for me, then you're going into the divorce process. And the first step there, if you haven't already in your, you know, process where you're trying to figure out if you're getting a divorce, is to find opinions that matter. So you want to start interviewing attorneys and getting the information that's important so that you know exactly what your life could look like going forward. That's the first. Okay. So you want to interview lawyers once you've decided that it's going to happen. Now, has this already become a mutual decision or this is like you've decided that you're getting a divorce, but you haven't maybe told your partner, you know, is that when you start interviewing the lawyers? So it's interesting you say that. It all depends on the person. So nothing is like one size fits all in the divorce process whatsoever. So anyone who's listening, who's going through whatever, your process is your own. But I will say that if you're thinking about a divorce and don't know whether it's right or you're, you know, really know that you're going to get a divorce, you want to interview either way. So even if you haven't told your spouse, but you're wondering if divorce is right for you, it's you're in the information gathering um, place. And I always think the more information, the more knowledge, the better. I'm thinking, though, like if you're considering it and then you start interviewing divorce attorneys, that kind of me- it doesn't commit you mentally to going through with it. But that's like that's going to be a big mental step that you're like you're beyond the, it's like when you're thinking about quitting smoking, you're like in the pre contemplative stage versus the contemplative stage, like you've really reached a hurdle there or or, or overcome a hurdle rather. Yeah, I can see it that way as well. I think that I will tell you that some of my clients or potential clients that come in never go forward with divorce because we'd walk through the potential process. Some say, okay, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to go back home. I'm going to see if I can work it out. And I may see them a year or two down the road 
So any good divorce lawyer will see whether you're ripe for divorce. And if they don't think that you're there, they're going to tell you, hey, I'm not sure this process is right for you right now. And I always try to fix marriages if there's a happy way to stay together. Got it. Okay. So in some situations, it may be like they've like, you kind of help them look over the edge of this precipice and they're like not, they realize they're not ready to jump and they just head on back. Yeah. And maybe they say to me a lot of times like, well, what would you recommend? And I say, you know, there's a lot of other options that you and your spouse could look into before you really take this jump, because I really don't think you're quite there at that breaking point yet. And what about that? Is this a myth that like if I were to interview you, say, as a lawyer, then my wife wouldn't be able to take you on as their lawyer. There's this now this conflict of interest. So if you're interested, you like find all the like top lawyers in the area and interview them so that you've boxed your spouse out from using them. OK, so I'm glad you said that, because on my podcast, How Not to Suck a Divorce, we talk about this all the time. This is a big, at least in, in Illinois, this is a big myth, and it probably is in the bigger areas as well. A lot of people go lawyer shop. They'd hit every big firm in town, every, you know, what they called sharks back in the day, just to knock them out of the race. Well, right now, at least where I'm at, that's not necessarily the case because firms have gotten bigger. So you could effectively come talk to me, not hire me and say, I'm just going to think about it. And your spouse could hire my partner. They couldn't hire me, of course, because I've already spoken to you, but they could certainly hire one of my partners. And that is never a comfortable position to be in. Got it. And so it is true that you can't work with someone that your spouse interviewed, but you're saying there are so many attorneys out there. It doesn't rule out your entire firm, just you as an individual. Exactly. And that's where we are right now. Again, it varies state to state. So you want to ask that question. But as long as the firm is set up correctly and has the right policies and procedures in place to really kind of wall off the attorney that met with your spouse, it's clear, it's free, and they can hire that partner. You know, you said you were going to walk us through the process. And the first step is identifying or inter interviewing attorneys and figuring out if it's really right for you. OK, what's the next step? OK, let's say you've decided. I always say interview at least three attorneys if possible, because like doctors, everyone's going to have a different opinion. Everyone has a different background, different upbringing, and all of those things matter. And so you want to choose the attorney where you feel like you have the best strategy, but also the best rapport with them, because you're going to be talking about your deepest, darkest fears and secrets in this process. And you want to make sure that you're not afraid to pick up the phone or come in and say what you need to say to your lawyer. That's choosing the lawyer. And this is kind of a quick process through the divorce process. Let's just say you chose the lawyer. Now it's determining, all right, we're going to move forward for divorce. How are we going to do that? And what I mean by that is, are we filing paperwork? Are we not filing paperwork because we think that maybe, you know, on bigger cases that we handle, we want to really maintain confidentiality. Maybe we want to mediate the case. We want to stay out of court. There's a lot of things that you need to talk to your lawyer about what path is right for you. And at this point, <laughs> are both parties aware that a divorce is happening? Sometimes not. So a lot of times when the other side, there could be a reason why we don't clue them in that this is happening. Maybe there's some kind of abuse, financial abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, those kind of things. Sometimes like those issues, we want to file and get that thing on file just for protection. And then we serve them with the paperwork. A lot of times, and what I'm trying to do as a divorce attorney at my age is to shift the narrative of what divorce attorneys have always done. You know, we get a bad rap because it's always been guns blazing. Let's just blow up the entire family bill as much as possible and get you divorced. But that's not really best for families and it's not best for my clients. So I'm trying to do it better where we can work together if everybody calms down. And so it's my job to get everybody in that place if possible. So if we all know it's coming, I work with my client to talk to their spouse if they haven't talked to their spouse about it coming, how to say it, how to keep things calm. And then we talk about what's the best process going forward for your family and how do we do this, keeping it calm and keeping your money in your own pocket. I would imagine also that helps you sleep at night, just taking that approach to being more as human as possible and trying to make your client and their spouse and their entire family's lives as stable and as whole as possible, as opposed to running up a tab. And I would imagine it's the same as physicians. If you're spending your entire day like hustling and trying to bill as much as possible, 
yeah, I mean, you might be driving a fancy car, but like that's not a fulfilling life and you're probably not going to sleep very well and it's not going to last very long. But if your object is to make other people's lives better, then that seems like a more sustainable existence. I totally agree with you. And you know, the other thing is one, it's just the way that I look at it and any good lawyer that you're interviewing or trying to figure out if that's the right fit for you should be looking at it is we, your family should be redefined, not broken. So you're still a family after your divorce, whether you have kids or not, you created a family unit and it's just going to look different going forward. So my view is let's make it look different, but let's make it work. Let's redefine it, not implode it. Okay. So you had said entering, you know, the, the previous image of the divorce inter- attorney entering guns blazing, that's a mistake, right? And the clients shouldn't feel that way either, right? That'd be a mistake. So what are some of the other mistakes or landmines that one can step on, at least when they're in that either contemplative state or they're in, in the initial stages of divorce? Yeah, that's a good question. So one of the big landmines that I it just makes me cringe. So you've already decided that you're going to get divorced. You have a lawyer and that lawyer is not creative at all. And what they say is, OK, we're going to file the paperwork and we're going to serve your spouse. And what does that mean? That means that essentially they file paperwork with the court. They give the paperwork to what's called a process server, some man or woman that goes out and physically hands the paperwork to your spouse. I will tell you, unless it's very rare, I would say less than 10 percent of my cases do I ever start the case that way. Why? Because it's a recipe for disaster. Nobody wants to be served paperwork like that at their work, at their home, in front of the kids, especially if they don't know it's coming. There's a better way to do it. So that is a big landmine, I think, in starting the case. It really starts it out with a bad tone. Wasn't there just a famous celebrity divorce where that happened on stage? Yes, I did see that. And, you know, I would hope that those lawyers had a plan and there was some reasoning. You know, I have done a lot of celebrity divorce myself. There's a lot that go on behind the scenes that people don't know about and will never know about. So I can only assume there was something going on at that. But yes, I mean, talk about cringeworthy. Even the divorce attorney in me watched it and cringed like it was awful to see. We're talking about the process of divorce. Can we continue to kind of advance us through what it looks like? All right. So the first, so now we're in the process. We filed the paperwork or we're moving forward. And I'm going to be talking to my client about, is this a litigation case where we need a judge to actually call balls and strikes in court? Or do we think we can do this a different way? And there's different ways to do it now. It's kind of like a platter, a menu of what you want your divorce to look like. Another option would be mediation, where there is an attorney or a former judge that's the mediator, the neutral in your case. So you are, in my cases, going with your lawyer to a mediation session with a neutral as your spouse is with their lawyer. That's one way I love mediation. I think it's a fabulous way to get things done and save costs. Another way is collaboration. Um, Another way is working with therapists. So there's a lot of um, accessories to divorce. And so you want to know which way, what path you're going on. So you determine the path right away, hopefully. So I would imagine now that we're, we've got different paths in front of us, like we can't really finish this dialogue that way. Like what happens next? Well, it depends what you did. Like, are you going through the courts? Are you going through mediation? Are you working with therapists? Like, I, I would imagine there's different things that happen now, or is there some common thread that we can use to kind of finish the process. Yeah. So there are, you're right. So every process is slightly different. The good news is that if one process doesn't work, generally you can pivot and go into another process. So I always say, let's start at the more amicable of a process and see if we can get it done there. And if we can't, we all know our way to the courthouse. Court is generally never my first preference. But yes, I agree that there is a common thread to all divorce cases. So what do we have to do? Let's just say it's a family with children involved that are under the age of 18. We need to figure out what that looks like. What does parenting time look like? What do holidays look like? Who's making the decisions? How are those decisions being made? So in Illinois, where I practice, we have to get two different things together to get a divorce. One is called an allocation judgment, which is exactly what I just described. What happens with the kids? How do we do that? The other thing is called a marital settlement agreement or a judgment. In most states, they call it a judgment of some sort. That's the money. 
how do we divide up the money, the assets, who's paying who what, that kind of thing. So commonly across all the different processes, I would say that you have to have a comprehensive financial outlook or picture or balance sheet to be able to really kind of start talking about what's there and how do we divide this. Okay. So you mentioned the kids. Like, I would imagine that's a huge issue. Like, it's probably money and kids and, like, that's the 99% of the conversation or or, or negotiation. Is that is that correct? Like, money and kids. Yes, absolutely. Kids are usually number one. I like to put them always first. Yeah. So how do we protect the kids from the negative effects of divorce? Because there inevitably will be some fallout, right? How do you minimize that? So you minimize it by figuring out in advance, what issues do you think are going to pop up? We all know that divorce is going to affect children in some ways. And in, I will tell you, sometimes it affects them in the positive, meaning a lot of times people are like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't bear to move out and get two homes. How is it going to affect the kids? Most of the time, intense households, even households where the spouses don't think it's that tense, when they do make two households, and the household then is actually much more calm, the children are happier. They are less tense. They're more relaxed with you, et cetera. So yes, putting the kids first, how do we mitigate? Therapy is always a wonderful way if your kids are struggling. Um, finding a good therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever you need, your divorce lawyer will have resources for you with that. The other thing is never say anything bad about the other parent. Never. It doesn't help you. It's not going to help you. And the kids will not forget it. If you're one of those that's like, yeah, but my spouse is so bad. They've done X, Y, and Z. It's just, you know, they need to know the truth. Well, guess what? They will know the truth when their brains are mature enough to know the truth. You don't have to say it. You don't have to give them a letter. You don't have to explain it to them. They're going to know who did what and who was the stand-up parent. Yeah. It reflects poorly on you, you know, even when adults are talking to other adults. Like if you throw your spouse under the bus in front of your friends, like it reflects poorly on you. Yes. Agreed. You know, same thing with them to the nth degree. You mentioned about the tense household, like, and it gets less tense after the separation. It, that reminds me of a George Costanza line from Seinfeld, where he said that he's the product of his parents having not gotten divorced, having stayed together. So Exactly. Exactly. That's one of the big myths, you know, that I'm going to mess up the kids if we divorce. Well, guess what? A lot of times, if you're at the divorce process or even like at the door's step of divorce, your kids are probably feeling something. They all know more than everybody thinks. And I don't care what age it is. All the research shows that they know more than you, than they let them, basically. Yeah. Even if they don't hear it, they feel it. They see it. Let's take a step to even before marriage and talk about prenups, right? Just my own history. My wife and I each actually consulted with an attorney before we got married because I was an attending and doing well, and her income wasn't quite that much, but she had some savings. And lo and behold, my divorce, my attorney told me, Brad, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? She's the moneyed spouse. spouse. She has some savings. You have debt. You have <laughs> nothing to protect. This would not, I was like, but what about my future earnings? He's like, there's nothing we can do about that in New York state at least. So what are you thinking? She's the moneyed spouse. Yeah. There was no prenup for us. Talk to us about the role of a prenuptial agreement. Yeah. Prenups are really great tools to kind of navigate a potential divorce and what it looks like. Actually, sorry. I just want to say, but the benefit of the prenup is it allowed, even though we didn't go through with it, it allows us to have what would have been difficult and what were difficult conversations about money. So we had these, it was a very expensive way paying these, you know, expensive attorneys for their time just to facilitate this conversation that we then had about how we were going to handle our finances. And that conversation might not have happened, or at least as quickly, if we hadn't gone through that process. So that was that was a benefit to sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, no, you're right. So I think not everyone needs a premium, just like you learned, right? Not everyone is ripe for a prenup, depending on where you are in life. However, I mean, you're running a doctor's podcast. So most of the time, if doctors have been on their own or out in the workforce for quite some time and paid down most of their debt, you know, they'd probably be candidates for a prenup. Second marriages, usually that's where I'm really advocating a prenup. They've been through a divorce already. They want to know what life looks like if they go forward and don't have a prenup. 
Prenups can basically modify the law of divorce. They can negotiate away certain things. So everyone hears, you know, alimony, maintenance, all these payments that, you know, come due under a divorce. Well, a prenup can modify what would have to be paid if you do get divorced and tie it to d- different things. The one thing that prenups, at least where I am in Chicago and probably many other states, do not do, they do not touch anything children related or child support related. So that's a no no for negotiation for obvious reasons. And if you are one of those doctors listening and you're already married, And you're like, oh, no, I didn't get a prenup. I should have gotten one. Well, guess what? There's always what's called a post. It's the new hot thing to do. (laughs) So all is not lost. There's a post up if you need it. But I mean, in theory, you've lost your leverage, right? Like we, because the idea about the prenup is like, we can't get married unless we agree on this. But now you're already married. So yeah, your leverage is we agree on this or we divorce. I mean, it's not a pleasant experience, but a lot of people who want them for other reasons, maybe it's financial, like they think one spouse is spending too much, we can negotiate, all right, here's your monthly allowance. This is what's going to happen if you get divorced. Is everyone on the same page? Maybe the spouse that's spending too much says, well, the reason I spend too much is I don't have access to my own account with money in it because you control everything. So there's things that we can do to make it feel more equal and keep the marriage together going forward. Sounds possibly more expensive than a marriage counselor that might be able to help you sort that stuff out. Yes. So I always counsel people coming in for postnups that this is basically negotiating a full divorce. Are you ready for this? Are you truly on board for this? This is the end of part one of two. Part two coming out soon. Make sure to check it out. And now a final word from our sponsor. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand that life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness, injury, or catastrophic event could put you and your family in a devastating financial situation. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Ravitz builds human connections before they create quotes. Visit PearsonRavitz.com today and embark on a journey of safeguarding your future. Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please, share it, or like it, or comment on a social media post. Or write us a five-star review. Something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. Even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you. This is not a doctor-patient relationship and this is not medical advice or financial advice or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to The Physician's Guide to Doctoring.